For years and years and years, I used to rage about the teaching of nomenclature in organic chemistry courses because even back as far as decades now, computers have been able to apply the IUPAC rules with, with obvious in, insane speed and immeasurable accuracy, right? Essentially 100% accuracy. And so we can easily use computers and tools like Kendra to convert a structure into a name in literally milliseconds. And so it leaves us wondering, why is this worth knowing? Why is the IUPAC nomenclature system worth studying at all. And I'll say I've mellowed out in my old age quite a bit in terms of recognizing the potential value that nomenclature has in appreciating, in, in helping you develop an appreciation for the nature of organic structure and developing good habits in how you look at and think about organic molecules and how they're put together. And one place where this comes up in the, is in this idea of isomerism and equivalent or inequivalent representations. Equivalent representations of the same compound two different ways. When you're first starting out in organic chemistry, it can be relatively easy to be fooled by equivalent representations, two equivalent ways of drawing the same compound, for example, that just differ in conformation, the way single bonds are arranged. And if we're doing something like enumerating all the possible isomers of a given molecular formula, we want to avoid those equivalent representations to avoid drawing the same molecule twice. And thinking in terms of IUPAC nomenclature, where's the parent chain and where are the substituents and what are they called, will help you think about these representations in a systematic way. So, for example here, say we were tasked with drawing all of the isomers that contain seven carbons and are saturated acyclic alkanes. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in this compound, and we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in this compound, and only single bonds, so these are indeed potentially isomers, but they might be two equivalent representations of the same compound. And to check that, we can go through the process of naming the two, and if their names come out the same, they are necessarily identical compounds. Right, this is the beauty of the IUPAC nomenclature system, in a sense. So thinking in terms of IUPAC nomenclature is one way we can systematically evaluate whether these are the same or not. So let's do that, starting with the parent chains in each compound. Take a moment to pause the video and identify the parent chains in these compounds. Hopefully you noticed that both of these have five carbon parent chains. And there are a couple of different ways to designate the parent chain in each of these, but the purple highlighting is how I did it. This sort of M-shaped chain is necessarily the parent chain in this molecule on the right. And uh, well, of course, we could have gone this way, I guess, as well. That's a five carbon chain as well. And, and here I did it as kind of this U-shape, although you could, of course, go this way. Those are both five carbon chains, and they're going to give equivalent names. These are both pentanes. Their parent chains both contain five carbons. They're both acyclic, and um, so they are both pentanes, but they also have substituents, and we want to consider the substituents as well. I see two methyl groups in each of these, and we want to think about not just what the substituents are, but what their numbers would be. So here, for example, this methyl group is showing up at carbon 1, 2, 3, and the other methyl group is showing up at carbon 2 in this structure. So we have a 2 three dimethyl pentane going on here. If I think about the other structure, well, I have a methyl group again at carbon one, two, three, and another methyl group at carbon two. So in both cases, I have two, three dimethyl substituents. So the names of the two compounds are exactly the same. They are both two, three dimethyl pentane. In other words, they are the same compound, two representations of the same compound, differing only in conformation, differing only in rotation about a single bond, specifically rotation about this single bond is how these two compounds differ. So IUPAC nomenclature, again, can help you think about whether two representations are the same or not. Two representations that give the same IUPAC name are necessarily the same compound. Let's talk a little bit about the stability of alkanes. One way we can measure stability is as enthalpy, using strategic enthalpy changes to see which compounds are more or less stable. And the basic idea here is, let's say we're taking advantage of an exothermic process like combustion. Combustion is generally profoundly exothermic, very negative delta H values here. But the less exothermic 
the combustion process, the more stable the starting alkane is. And this is particularly true when your reactants are isomeric so that your products of combustion are the same. So here, for example, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We have octanes. Uh, we have eight carbon alkanes, I should say. We've got linear octane right here and various branched isomers containing one or more substituents here and here. And because these are isomeric with each other, they all undergo combustion to give the same products, 8CO2 and 9H2O. These are all C8H18 alkanes. And so differences then in the delta H of these combustion reactions must be due solely to differences in the stability of the starting alkane, since even the O2 reactant is the same in all reactions, 12 and a half moles of O2 per mole of alkane combusted, right? And when we run these experiments and measure the heats of combustion of these various alkanes, we find that the least exothermic is observed for the branched isomer here, this highly branched um, compound with two tert butyl groups linked to each other. And the linear compound has the greatest, the most exothermic, I should say, heat of combustion. And so what this shows us is that for the same molecular formula, for isomeric alkanes, linear isomers are generally less stable than branched isomers. And this has important practical applications, right? This means that we can get more bang for our buck out of a linear hydrocarbon in terms of the energy extracted or available from combustion than from a branched hydrocarbon. So for example, there's a literal economic interest in catalysts and reaction conditions that could potentially convert this branched isomer into the isomeric linear compound. And this is an area of research that the petroleum industry is, is heavily invested in and has made great strides in over the years.